Thank you very much for coming. Uh, my name's Simon Leadham and I'm the uh, director of the Oxford Centre for Personalised Medicine and uh, I'd like to warmly welcome you all to our third annual public lecture. Um, the uh, Centre of Personalised Medicine was actually founded, our inaugural lecture was this day three years ago, so uh, it's a great day to have a third distinguished guest come and visit us. Um, the Oxford Centre for Personalised Medicine is, an inter is a, a, a partnership between St Anne's Univ uh, College and the Wellcome Trust Centre for Human Genetics and it's the idea of this is to try and uh, engage great sections of the community, the clinician community, the science community and the public community with the int integration of genomics into personalising healthcare. And today it's a great pleasure to welcome one of the true leaders and pioneers of the genomic age. David Altshuler trained as a physician at Harvard Medical School and worked as a practicing endocrinologist at Massachusetts General before starting some research career which has lasted some 20 years, focusing on human genetic variation. He was instrumental in mapping and understanding uh, human variation based with leading the, code, the SNP consortium, the International HapMap consortium and the thousand genomes, but all the while has retained his interest in the genetics of, of, of human disease. Together with Mark McCarthy and another, another under, uh, Oxford researchers, he's been instrumental in trying to pave the way for using genetics to understand type 2 diabetes, and that's led the way to understanding the genomics of many other diseases, including lupus, cancer, and others. David is also one of the four founding members of the Broad Institute and has served as the, uh, the Institute's de Deputy Director, uh, and he's currently the Executive Vice President of Global Research and the Chief Scientific Officer of Vertex Pharmaceuticals. There's a very long list of prizes that David's won. I'm sure he wouldn't want me to go through them, but there are in the, they are in the uh, sheet that you have on him. And I'd just like to point out that David is a very old friend of the Wellcome Trust Centre for Human Genetics. He's collaborated with many of our senior faculty and has served on our International Science Advisory Board as well. So on an extraordinary day for the US, we welcome David to this side of the, state, uh, this side of the pond, and we're very proud and privileged to ask you to give the third annual Thank seminar. you very much. Thank you. All right. So, uh, first of all, it's a great pleasure to be here today, uh, in part because of the many connections I have uh, to the people who are in this room. Uh, and, uh, but I do have a brief story to tell before I get on with my talk, which is 12 years ago, I guess sort of by the calendar to the day, um, I agreed to come to the Wellcome Trust to review what ended up becoming the Wellcome Trust Case Control Consortium. And that was on election day of 2004. And I got on a plane and I thought that John Kerry had won the election, but it turned out that George Bush had when I landed. So I should have known better than actually to take this, to take this uh, uh, invitation because in fact last night I got on a plane at nine o'clock and the plane took off, it looked like Hillary Clinton would win and here we are. So um, hopefully my talk will be a distraction from whatever your glee, if you're very happy or your sadness uh, and we'll think about human genetics and precision medicine for a few minutes. So I'm going to personalize this story just a little bit and, and tell you about uh, sort of my journey, trying to put together the work we've done and the work I'm doing now. Uh, and I start with the first day, actually, I started medical school in 1986. We were handed a book, and the book was a brief pamphlet, really, more than anything else, written by Francis Weld Peabody, who was a great uh, Harvard doctor of the 1920s. And in it was this quotation. It's actually the closing line of this piece. It says, one of the essential qualities of the clinician is interest in humanity, for the secret of the care of the patient is in caring for the patient. And I will admit that when I was 22 years old and I was handed this book, I thought, what? Like, it didn't make sense to me because I, we were young medical students, it was the first day, and I really couldn't imagine that there was, uh, that there was something to be considered here other than a focus on patients, because I was an idealistic 22-year-old, and I assumed that everything in medicine was very much focused on patients and how to impact patients, how to learn from patients. It turns out a month before, although I didn't actually discover this for some 20 years afterwards, there was an editorial in Nature. And the editorial in Nature was on the occasion of the great meeting at Cold Spring Harbor in 1986 when two things happened. One was it was announced that there was uh, the positional cloning for the first time of human disease genes uh, from two colleagues of mine actually at Harvard, uh, chronic granulomas disease and Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and also a famous meeting where it was discussed whether or not to sequence the human genome. 
And this prompted Miranda Richardson in Nature, I don't know Miranda Richardson, I don't know, if, if I, I don't know anything about her, but she wrote this editorial in which she wrote, uh, you can see the title, it says, the proper study of mankind, would sequencing the human genome be the, worth the effort? And it says, there is no scientific reason for studying man. That's a quote to someone. But it goes on to argue, it's not just a, uh, it's a provocative piece. It says basically, and I recommend it to you if you want to read it, to say how far we've come in 30 years. It says, if the skill and ingenuity of modern biology are already stretched to interpret sequences of known importance, such as then those of Duchenne's and chronic granulomas disease, what possible use could there be for more sequence? It goes on to argue that, for example, 99% of the human genome is junk. There's no point to sequencing the junk. Some people think there's function in the junk, but if there was function in the junk, you'd never figure it out by sequencing it. Just it turns out, although it's not the folks in my talk, we figured out that actually about 8% of the human genome or more is functional and was figured out exactly by sequencing it. So this just shows you how at the time, there was this uh, you know, sort of positioning as a young medical student of focus on patients. But what this argument, article actually says, and it was actually the world into which I entered, may not have been true at Oxford, but it was true at Harvard Medical School, that really we could learn everything we needed to know from the study of simple model systems, cells in a dish, mice, worms, fruit flies, et cetera, and that there wasn't really a great reason for studying human beings. Now, what I came to believe over 30 years career now in medicine and science is actually that what we don't know about biology, but also in particular about human biology, is vastly greater than what we do know. That actually I came to believe over the course of a career that the simplified model systems, for example, of type 2 diabetes that Mark and I studied together so enjoyably for many years, that those models might have had very little to do, actually, with the disease in patients. And also that as a clinician, there were mo many, many diseases for which we did not have adequate therapy. And this led me on a journey uh, myself to what some people you know, call precision medicine. It's a concept here that you know, everyone can, there are different definitions. I'm not promulgating any particular one. But to me, and this did end up motivating much of my career, the idea of, first of all, a strong understanding of the molecular pathophysiology of disease in human beings. So not extrapolating from a model, although you could learn a hypothesis from a model and test it in a person, but that ultimately <coughs> we needed to understand the biology of people that actually our goal was to address the root cause of the disease, the underlying cause, and treat to modify the long-term consequences, not the symptoms. And ideally, and I'm going to talk some about how challenging this is, we would actually intervene before people got sick, so they never got sick, rather than actually waiting till they got sick and then treating the symptoms. And this is a very simple concept that I think has much currency, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about, about some of the work I did, and, now, and then more recently the story of cystic fibrosis done by my colleagues at Vertex, because I think that it actually illustrates many of the opportunities, but also the challenges of realizing this kind of vision. So clearly for me, a seminal moment was in 1989 when this paper was published, this issue of science had the cloning of the cystic fibrosis gene. I was now in graduate school, and, and there were two things about this paper of note. One is, there was this disease, cystic fibrosis, that was defined based on clinical features. Cystic means the, the dilatation of a duct. Fibrosis means scarring. And it was known that the disease had thick, sticky mucus that led to infections and then ultimately to scarring, decrease in lung function, pancreatic function. But why that happened wasn't known. And the positional cloning of the gene and the rapid understanding within a couple of years that actually this was a chloride transporter did explain the underlying pathophysiology of the disease in a powerful way. The other thing that just for the cognoscenti is there are these red and orange and blue and green bars on that behind the young man with cystic fibrosis. Does anyone know what those are? Those are haplotypes. The way the, C the CFTR gene was cloned was through a haplotype analysis. The delta 508 founder allele sits on the red haplotype, and that's actually how the gene was cloned. And that actually was much of the, one of the underlying ideas that led to haplotype mapping in the HapMap project. Something somehow lost in history was sometimes discussed as if it came out of sequencing the human genome. It actually came out of the HLA, and it came out of cystic fibrosis and other such examples. So I did medical training, and I think there's many things that one learns in medical training, but Barbara McClintock wrote that if you're going to be a geneticist, you need a feeling for the organism. In her case, the organism was corn. One of the things that I learned about jumping genes and won a Nobel Prize for that work, I feel like, and I think many of my colleagues feel, that working in a hospital gives you a feeling for human biology and human disease. And so I chose to get involved in the Human Genome Project, worked with many people in this room, and it was an amazing experience that I'm not really going to talk much about, except to say that if anyone had said to us, I think, 15 or 20 years ago, that just the technological and data and understanding advances that have been made would have been made, I don't think anyone would have believed it. I think we, we really, there was doubt you would sequence the genome once, 
when we were talking about finding out variation, we never imagined that the genome would be sequenced today thousands and tens and hundreds of thousands of times. And this was a supporting feature and actually motivated by and ultimately a supporting uh, infrastructure for identifying genes for first Mendelian diseases because the tools of linkage and positional cloning and knowing where the genes are contributed greatly to this rather remarkable rise where if you go to that 1986 meeting that I mentioned, if you look at 1986 on this plot, you'll see there are virtually no genes identified for simple Mendelian disorders. Within uh, 15 years, there are a couple of thousand and today there's four or five thousand. And that's just information that tells us the basis of many diseases, but there was very little progress in actually common diseases. As you can see on this plot, the blue line is actually human complex traits and there's really no progress. And that's where actually in 1994, when I was an intern in medicine, I read a paper by that guy up there, John Todd, where he wrote about doing linkage studies for type 1 diabetes and I became very intrigued by the idea of actually becoming, it's all your fault, John, of actually becoming a, a diabetes geneticist and uh, did in fact end up becoming one. And uh, the idea was that we would figure out these complex traits. And I'm not really going to talk that much about this because I want to talk about cystic fibrosis, but I will say that together with Peter and many other people in this room, we undertook this project that took about 15 years that was to catalog and characterize human genetic variation. And when we started this effort, just one sort of illustration of how much progress the field has made is when we started this project, and I don't mean this as a, as a uh, thought experiment, I mean this is basically what we did. If you took DNA from an individual and you randomly sequenced bits of it and found variation where the two copies, the one from the mother and the one from the father differed, and you asked how often when I find that variation is it one I've seen before that's in a database that I know anything about its relationship to populations or to disease, the answer was zero because there was no public database and there were only a few thousand genetic variants known. Today, if I took anyone in this room and I sequenced your genome in its completeness, more than 99% of the genetic variation in each of you is tabulated in a database and the common genetic variation, which turns out makes up 98% or 99% of the genetic variation in you, is all been queried for relationship to disease in millions of people. And again, that's just information. It tells you about how genetic variants, both common and rare, play a role in disease. But again, I don't think we ever imagined actually we'd make this much progress uh, in terms of just being able to do it. And we certainly learned many things surprising and, and uh, unsurprising. In type 2 diabetes, which is Mark McCarthy, I had the good fortune to meet Leif Group and Mike Benke in particular. And we worked together with incredible uh, enjoyment for uh, 18 years and they probably continue with even greater enjoyment now that I'm not doing it with them. But nonetheless, uh, when we started this work, um, there really were the Mendelian forms of type 2 diabetes that make up 1 or 2 percent of patients with type 2 diabetes had been defined by Graham Bell and Philippe Frogel and others, but, and uh, Andrew Hattersley and others. But if you looked at the common form of diabetes, there was essentially nothing that turned out to be reproducible. There were claims, actually th hundreds of them, of claims in the literature of some polymorphism playing a role in disease. None of them actually on subsequent study at that time proved to be reproducible and valid. They were mostly false positives for a variety of reasons. But together, and actually again, people in this room were pioneers in this, we developed as a field high standards for how to do this and how to obtain robust reproducible locus specific associations that really represented and represent today some genetic factor influencing disease rather than a false association. And over the course of many years, as we did these studies systematically for type 2 diabetes, we found at this time, you know, 80 different regions of the genome that had genes in them that were associated in some way with risk of diabetes. And I say it in that way because it turns out linkage disequilibrium or haplotype structure is a double-edged sword, meaning that one of the reasons we could make this progress was because you didn't need to have sequenced the entire genome to test all the common genetic variation because there were these haplotypes and that was the basis for doing the studies. And it turned out, now that we have sequenced lots of genomes, we missed almost nothing through that approach. There was a lot of debate about whether or not that approximation was complete. We've now, in fact, with Mark and others, we published in Nature just a few months ago the complete sequencing and compared it to the GWAS studies and found we didn't really miss any common variants for not having sequenced because the methods worked. But it's a double-edged sword because if there are many genetic variants that are tethered to one another, when you find the association, you don't know which one's the cause and which one is the innocent bystander, or it could be there's more than one, and those are proven to be hard problems to sort out. But nonetheless, we made some progress in this, and it caused me, perhaps, uh, when we started to make that progress around 
maybe five, six, seven years ago to start thinking more about what was it worth because obviously up until that time there'd been a lot of thought about how do we try and get to the point of learning some things about this disease. And there are four things that I would just mention. One is to test existing hypotheses about a disease using genetic variants as instrument variables in place of a randomized trial. I'm going to talk about that briefly. To generate new hypotheses about biology, that's genetic mapping. Find it, one of those new sequences that Miranda Richardson wrote about and try and figure out what it does. The most valuable of those would be things that could be targets for therapy. And then if you could also predict who would need that therapy or who would get sick to a greater extent, that would be valuable. And I'm really just going to touch on just uh, three things that were uh, uh, of, of interest, but there's a, a large literature here I don't have time to, to go into. But one thing that we did that, that really impacted my own career and hopefully had some contribution to the field was this, this paper, which I'm not going to describe in detail, it was published four years ago, where we decided to look together with, say, Kath Reeson on the right and Ben Voigt on the left. They, had, they were at the time postdocs in my lab and had the idea of asking the question, we know that LDL cholesterol is associated with heart attack risk and we know it's causal, both because it had previously been published, that genetic variants that affect LDL have a predicted effect on heart attack. And it had also been shown with statin medicines that lowering LDL reduces risk of heart attack. So there's really no doubt there. But the so-called good cholesterol, or HDL, is a predictor, inversely, of heart attack risk. Lower levels are associated with um, higher rates of heart attack risk. And it was actually, I was trained as a physician to tell patients, you should raise your HDL. If you, there was no way to do it. You should exercise or do something. But that it would be good, because it was assumed that the correlation was causal. And we realized, having done genome-wide association studies for LDL and HDL and heart attack, that we had the tools we needed to ask whether or not HDL was causal in heart attack. Because we could ask if there are genetic variants that affect LDL, and they do have the predicted effect on a heart attack risk, and that's something called Mendelian randomization. I won't go into it because your genotypes are inherited at birth and not altered by the disease. So they can only be causal. They're not caused by. Then we could take the genetic variants that affected HDL and ask, do they affect heart attack risk? And this was not of just academic interest because at the time we were doing this work, torcetrabib had been studied for about a billion dollars by Pfizer, found to raise HDL and had not had a beneficial effect on heart attack. And that was taken to be, it might be a dirty drug or it had some effects on high blood pressure. So we did this work and actually the conclusion, which you can read in the paper, is that there's no relationship we could determine consistently between H variants that affect HDL, they have no effect on heart attack that's consistent, whereas the LDL ones had the exact predicted effect in the exact same people. And since that time, there have been four more large phase three failures of agents that had substantial effects on HDL and had no effect on heart attack. Although interestingly, the final one of those actually, which is a uh, multi-year study costing I think $500 million, continues to this day. And so I was very intrigued by this idea that just knowing whether or not that hypothesis was likely to play out would be of, in, of importance. The second idea, which I'm not going to talk more about, is just discovering these new clues. And there were, as I said, a uh, hundred of them, so I'm not going to talk about any particular one. This was a very gratifying paper. We did a study in Mexico and in uh, Latin Americans, uh, from Latinos from Los Angeles, on the idea that there might be genetic variants that were missed in our genome-wide association studies of Europeans, but might be common in this population and play a role in diabetes. And we could do it because we'd done the Thousand Genomes Project, or we're in the middle of it, and we discovered a greater diversity of genetic variation. And what we found when we did the study, which was published in Nature two years ago, was that whereas most of the things, or all pretty much of the variants we found in Europeans were recapitulated in this study, to the extent we had power to see them, there were two variants that were not seen elsewhere that had strong effects. And the one in particular, SLC 16A11, turned out to be an allele which is at 50 percent frequency in Native American populations, 10 percent in East Asian and absent from Europe and Africa, which turned out to be introgressed from Neanderthal. It was one of my favorite moments at the Broad Institute when we were presenting this work and said that population distribution, and David Reich raised his hand or someone in his lab and said, well, that sounds like Neanderthal. And so he said, well, I have a Neanderthal genome on my, I have the published Neanderthal genome. Nope, it doesn't have your variants. And someone in his group said, well, I have an unpublished Neanderthal genome. Looked it up and it was homozygous for the two risk SNPs. And so in the space of 10 minutes, we went in that collaborative community from a hypothesis to the answer that it was a Neanderthal allele, which is actually more of a curiosity than having any other biological or medical relevance, but it's still interesting. It turns out this variant, because of its population distribution and effect size, explains 25% of the health disparity in type 2 diabetes in Latinos. 
just the genotype at this variant alone, and it's a previously uncharacterized uh, monocarboxylic acid transporter that has four variants in it, and there's work that's now submitted for publication from my former lab uh, that is, uh, gets at the mechanism of this, but I, I can't talk about it right now because it's from my former lab and I don't work there anymore. Um, the uh, final thing, and then I'll get on with the cystic fibrosis story, was increasingly I was motivated, my colleagues were motivated to look for alleles that could really directly impact drug discovery. And this paper came out of a collaboration with Pfizer, where actually uh, Tim Rolfe and I and David Cox, our, our good friend who died too young, at Pfizer put together a collaboration to look for the PCSK9 of type 2 diabetes. PCSK9 variants had already been found and had been published and shown that there were loss of function mutations that lowered LDL and that lowered risk of heart attack. And also the homozygotes were healthy and now there are two approved medicines for, that target PCSK9 based on that. And so we set out together with Leif Group and turned out to be another one of these wonderful collaborations around the world to look for that in type 2 diabetes. And miraculously, we actually found something that has many of those characteristics. I say miraculously just because we didn't find 10, we found one. And so the difference between one and zero is pretty small. We could easily not have found it. But nonetheless, what we found was we set up a study working with Leif Group where we took elderly obese individuals who uh, were completely euglycemic. They had completely normal blood sugar. They were our cases. And then our controls were young individuals who had high rates of, had diabetes. That, they would normally be your cases, but we were looking at them as the controls. We were looking for the variants, and we found Jason Flanick, who's the lead author, spectacular uh, scientist who's on the left there, found one, two people who had a, not, a, a stop codon in this gene, SLC30A8. SLC38 was found by Philippe Frogel, the beginning of the GWAS era, and Rob Sladek, to be associated with type 2 diabetes risk, a common variant. And the model in the field, I'm not going to go into it, was loss of function of this would cause diabetes. But Jason noted there were just two people. It had stop codons, and they were in the obese, elderly, euglycemic group. So 100,000 people later, multiple collaborations later, we actually got Decode Genetics and Amgen to give us their data. We showed, I think, beyond any reasonable doubt, you can look at the paper if you want, published in Nature Genetics a year ago or two years ago, that loss of function mutations in this gene actually protect from type 2 diabetes. So being heterozygous for any one of 12 loss of function mutations associated with a 65% reduced risk of type 2 diabetes, no other phenotype, in, uh, and it, including in individuals who are elderly and obese. So this was all, uh, and, and my understanding is, although Vertex isn't doing it, that there are multiple companies now working on this as a potential target. It has a known function. It's a zinc transporter uh, in the beta cells. And so there's, a, there's some things to follow up there. So what I came to realize, though, through these 18 years was, first of all, that what I really wanted to be involved in was actually getting to, the, I'm 52 years old, and I wanted to actually, before I retired, get to actually play a role in taking these kinds of insights and actually helping patients with them but also that this idea of precision medicine and personalized medicine, that there was a belief system that actually I came to realize didn't, didn't seem true to me, which was that the hard part was gonna be finding these genes and that there'd somehow be existing medicines and we'd just sort of shuffle the chairs on the Titanic and put the right medicines on the right people and we'd have magic benefit. But actually what you came to realize as you got closer to it and through consulting and collaborating with pharmaceutical companies was most often you had to make a new medicine based on this new mechanism because usually when you go in and find something new about biology and human biology or any other biology, you don't know about it before. There's no existing medicines. You have to go through the process of drug discovery. And so I realized for myself that we would never get there unless we were actually prepared to do that slog. We weren't gonna likely find that there was some medicine that was safe and wonderful and we could just now repurpose it and cure diabetes. Well, that may happen occasionally, but it's not a general strategy. The other thing I learned that really had an impact on my thinking was that the vast majority of the spend and the effort in the pharmaceutical and biotech industry is spent on failure. So you may have heard the number that it's about $2.3 billion to develop a medicine from conception to approval, and that actually is correct. That's, you can do it actually bottom up and it's very complicated. You can just take the entire spend of the biopharmaceutical industry and divide by the number of approvals. Or you can say, for example, Vertex in its 27 years has spent $9 billion on R&D and has had four medicines that have actually been approved and made to patients. And by the way, the four from Vertex puts us in the very top tier of, I think, a handful of companies started in the last 30 years that have gotten four medicines discovered in your own laboratories to the clinic. So this is hard stuff. And if you ask why is it hard, and this is a plot, this is a figure from paper by Mark Bunnage, who I'm pleased to say, along with Jillian Burgess, who's sitting over there, I was recently able to attract to come to Vertex to run research sites, and Mark Bunnage wrote this when he was at Pfizer, and points out that 
It takes 24 preclinical candidates to get one approved medicine. But if you ask where is the attrition, this is the 24 billion, but I mean the 2.3 billion is largely spent on the failures that don't get to the end. It's not the one that gets there. It's all the things you have to try to get there, and the spending on all of that. But the really expensive part is to fail in late stage clinical development, phase two and phase three. It turns out as much as I would like that research, the discovery of new medicines is what R&D spending about, it's not. Most of it's the D, it's the clinical trials. They're much more expensive than the R which is the research to discover the medicine. And if you look at this plot, you'll see that there is only 25% in this analysis that Mark published, and there are many other analyses like this, this is clearly correct, only 25% of compounds that go into phase two, so you've already worked on them for eight or 10 years, you've discovered the medicine, you've shown it's safe and it can go into people and you can get exposure, only 25% of those actually show clinical proof of concept. They actually get to the other side and benefit. And then there's a further attrition when you act to actually get to the market in late stage trials, but that's the big block. And it turns out many analyses of this have shown that the probably most significant factor is that is not, although these are all contributors, that you can't, that it's not safe. It turns out that's been largely de-risked, dialed out by good uh, investigation. It's actually most often that it just doesn't, it doesn't work. The hypothesis is not correct. And it makes you realize that what's going on is 10 years earlier, you have to actually make a hypothesis that if I could modulate this target, I would help the patient. It takes you 10 years to get to the hypothesis test, which is the phase two trial. And even after those 10 years, and even after all that work and all the preclinical models, only 25% of the time is it actually a yes, okay? And this is, for example, a, a just one last point on this. AstraZeneca published this analysis of their own internal pipeline, where they showed 88% of the failures in phase 2B, 88% were for efficacy, 60% uh, were in phase 2A. Most of these are just the medicines don't have the desired effect, but if you do this well, and I think most people in the industry do, you show that it's there. You show that it actually affects the target. It's not that you're miss that it's not that the drug doesn't work, it's that the hypothesis isn't correct. Okay? So this paper and multiple others said in a post hoc analysis, if you had that human genetic data, if you had human biology, at the beginning, the success rates were higher. And that makes sense when you realize that most of the hypotheses that were being tested for a period of decades were coming from model systems. They weren't coming from biology of people. They were coming from biology of model systems. So this led me, that's all a long entry to a fork in the road where I was actually, I thought I had the best job in the world at the Broad and Harvard and MIT, and I was very happy, but I actually wasn't really because I felt like what I wanted to do was be a part of that process. And so I took the sort of raggedy, uh, road up to the right that I didn't know how to climb rather than the smooth one that I just something like and I joined Vertex two years ago and I joined Vertex because when I was teaching human genetics at Harvard Medical School I was responsible with Joel Hirshhorn for the class that all the first years had to take I gave a lecture on therapy for genetic disease and before I got involved with the company I lectured about Kaleidico the story I'm going to tell you I lectured about this amazing story of how the CFTR gene was identified by positional cloning in 1989. Mike Welsh figures out in 1991 it's a chloride transporter. And how then this team of people uh, working, it turns out, in Vertex in San Diego and now around the world, figured out how to develop small molecules that actually improve the function of the CFTR protein. And at the time I was teaching this, actually, they first were seeking approval for their first medicine and then actually had approval for the first medicine. And I ended up joining the company both because I was excited to be part of trying to finish the job in CF that I'm going to tell you about, and also to try and do this in, in other diseases. So what I'm going to turn to now for the rest of the talk is to tell you the story of, of CF, which is not a story that I did, and although in the last two years I've hopefully contributed something, it's really the story of my colleagues, and I'll tell you who they, who they were and show you them at the end. But basically cystic fibrosis, as, as I've already mentioned, is a disease that's about 75,000 people in Europe and North America. It turns out because of the population genetics, there's a north-south cline in Europe, uh, the delta F508 allele, it's much more common in those parts of the world than it is in other parts of the world. It is caused entirely by mutations in the CFTR gene. There are no other causes of CF as far as we know. And the, uh, it, to this day, it remains a significant cause of premature morbidity and mortality. And at the time, uh, until Kaleidico was approved, there were no medicines that got at the underlying cause, the CFTR dysfunction, although there were very useful uh, therapies that had been developed that worked at the level of symptoms, infections, supportive care, and that had extended life. So as I already mentioned, 
the pathophysiology of the disease was made clear by the positional cloning and the function that CF, TR mutations, decreased chloride transport, thick mucus, mucus clogs the ducts and the pancreas and the lung, the seminiferous tubules, and basically it explains the entirety of the disease. And there was also this beautiful work done by the academic community and supported by the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation and investigators around the world that showed the genotype-phenotype correlation. And the reason I'm going to go through this story is I think there are a lot of lessons here about what we need to know to really take on one of these diseases and really uh, make substantial progress. So this, this data shows uh, on the x-axis CFTR function. This is actually an in vivo measure. You can measure the concentration of chloride in the sweat, but you can also do this, as I'll show you, in an in vitro assay, measuring the protein function of CFTR. And you can see that if you have severe CF, you have very low, near zero, uh, CFTR function. If you have actually 80% or more, carriers, it turns out, for reasons that have to do with regulation, have about 80%, not 50% CFTR function, and they have no symptoms. And actuarially, there are people in this room who are CFTR mutation carriers, just based on the frequency, because it's a common variant in European populations. And then intermediate levels of CFTR function in vitro and based on sweat chloride are associated with intermediate clinical syndromes. So there's a graded genotype-phenotype correlation. The other thing to realize, just to establish the disease, is that it is a progressive disease. So this is now data from the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation database of 27,000 people. It's kind of an amazing field because there's 75,000 people in the US and Europe. This is 28,000 of them because the field has really come together over the last few decades and has very organized registries and data which are incredibly valuable for doing the kind of things that we're trying to do. So this gives you the baseline of how th this measure of lung function, which I'll refer to later, FEV1, that even in someone six, eight, 10 years old is near normal because the disease, uh, there are other things, for example, pancreatic function that would have typically deteriorated by this age. But you can see the deterioration in lung function over time. So that's also important just to keep in mind that there's, there's an acute idea about this disease. Someone's at a given level, can we change it? But there's also the progression of the disease. Can we actually change the rate of, of decline over time? So the academic community had actually studied the different mutations because there was an allelic series. There were multiple mutations in this gene, actually 200 of them or more, and they had studied them, some of them in vitro and based on the phenotype, and had sorted them based on the molecular defect. And an oversimplification would be to say there are some that get to the cell surface and they have decreased channel gating activity, so they, they're there, but the channel doesn't open. And the others have, a, in particular, Delta F508, but that's not the only one. The common variant, Delta F508, has a trafficking defect so that the protein doesn't get to the cell surface. All right? And so you can imagine, um, and, and this is, I'm sorry to say, uh, sorry, this is the epidemiology, if you will. About half of people have Delta, are homozygotes for Delta F508 in the US and Europe. They have two copies of Delta F508. About 40% of people have on one copy Delta F508 and the other copy is a minimal function mutation, so a, law, a stop codon or something else. They have only one delta 508, no other function. There's a subset of people who have these gating mutations where the protein does get to the surface but doesn't open, and then there's a set of people who are homozygous for minimal function mutation, so they don't make any protein. So when you understand this, you can actually understand the approaches that you would take to treat the disease. If there is defective CFTR protein at the surface, then what the field called, we didn't coin this term, this was the term, the field coined this term, potentiators, which would be something that would open that channel and allow chloride to flux. If you had a defect in CFTR processing and trafficking, then what the field called correctors, which are proteins that would get that protein out of the endoplasmic reticulum and onto the cell surface. And then if you had no protein, you'd need some sort of genetic therapy. And what I'm going to describe to you is progress, um, tell you about progress that have led to FDA approved medicines on the top two and EMA approved medicines on the top two and I'll mention briefly the work we're doing on the third. So the final point about this approach which was I think distinctive was that the entire drug discovery program was done with human primary cells. So there was, none, there was no efficacy model in the entire CF program, there's not to this day at Vertex, that was an animal model that basically what was figured out years, years before was that there were protocols and they were optimized and perfected in our labs and now used, used by many others where you could take a lung from a patient that the patient either had a lung transplant and so they donated their lung or they died and they donated their lung to science and the cells, the bronchial epithelial cells could be removed from the lung, cultured, and then used actually 
to drive the medicinal chemistry program. There are very few programs in the history of this industry where medicinal chemistry was driven, the optimization over five years and thousands and tens of thousands of molecules, by testing human primary cells. And we have 60 different human primary cells of different genotypes that have been invaluable. And we do believe that one of the reasons this program has been successful is because we're not, again, using artificial models. We're actually using human primary cells that have the mutations of interest. So the first medicine to be approved was Ivacaftor. And this is now, on the left, patch clamping of CFTR channels from cells, human bronchial epithelial cells that have a gating mutation. You can see normally the channels opening and closing, that's the upper left. But you can see if you have a mutation called G551D, there are multiple gating mutations, but that's the most common one. There's no channel opening. And you can see also that the level of chloride transport is low, not surprisingly. And then if you add to that this, comp this compound, which is now the medicine Ivacaftor, it opens the channel and restores chloride transport. Now, as I'll, it should be clear, this wasn't like somebody designed a, a chemical and then it worked and it was a medicine. This was something like 10 years of work to find one that not only did this, but was potent and safe and had bioavailability and all these things. But this is the end stage of that in terms of this is research. But then there was the clinical development program that itself took uh, five years. And this is the phase three study that on the left shows you the cells, the human bronchial epithelial cells in vitro. That's just the before and after Ivacaftor. And on the right is the phase three trial published in New England Journal of Medicine that shows an acute change in lung function in this randomized trial. And then you can see at the end, patients who are in the placebo converted over to Ivacaftor and the boost in lung function that was obtained. This is in people only approved for people who have a specific set of mutations that are shown, that are gating mutations or residual function mutations that respond to Ivacaftor. The, the Delta F508 allele, which if you remember my slide, 90% of people with CF have either one or two copies of the Delta F508 allele, is a much more challenging problem, although I'll say making a potentiator for a chloride channel is not off-the-shelf drug discovery, but actually getting a protein that's stuck in the endoplasmic reticulum to the cell surface in a functional way I think is relatively unprecedented. And so again, this program worked, and you can see on the left in the, uh, the uh, western blot that shows in a normal this is, these are, again, from human bronchial epithelial cells. You can see on the left the mature form of CFTR in a wild-type cell. If you're delta F508, you see it doesn't get processed. And then the medicine Lumacaftor, if added, increases, doesn't completely, but gets more to the mature form. You can characterize that uh, in vitro. It turns out the protein that gets the surface itself has a gating defect. So the therapeutic approach actually has Ivacaftor and Lumacaftor. The Lumacaftor to get it to the cell surface, and then the Ivacaftor to potentiate it. You can see the in vitro data here, and this is the phase three, two phase three studies published in the Journal of Medicine of 1,000 people, actually, which is quite remarkable in a disease of uh, 75,000 people who had a phase three program with 1,000 of them. If you look at some other rare diseases, you see people going in for approvals with a handful of patients and historical controls. I'm very proud that my colleagues, and this was done before I was there, but that they did a 1,000 person randomized trial to really nail down what was the efficacy and safety profile across multiple parameters. So I've told you, again, about those are acute effects. Those are effects in the first six months. But a key question is, are those disease modifying, or are they just acute bumps, but the slope continues unchanged? And so I'll give you data that was just presented at the uh, North American CF meeting and another meeting in Europe earlier this year that is, is three years into this experience. You can't know the long-term data until you have long-term data. And so we're just beginning to get that data now, or Canby was only approved last year, which is Lumacaftor, Ivacaftor, Kaleidico five years ago. So this is data now comparing, in an observational study, people who are on Ivacaftor, and compared to the US and UK CF registries. And the top row is the comparison of patients in the US to the US registry, and in the bottom row is patients in the UK to the UK registry. You see quite consistent data with reductions of approximately uh, 40 to 50, to 60% in death rates, 50% uh, or higher for transplantation, uh, 40, the, the decrease in pulmonary exacerbations, which are lung infections that were seen in the randomized trials, continue after the randomized trials. So the database is, the data case is being built that this is not just an acute effect, but it's a sustained effect. And then the other key thing is to try and get at the rate of decline in lung function. Because remember, that's if you really want to change the course of disease. So these analyses, again, which are carried on now for uh, two and three years, two years for Orcambi, three years Kaleidico, they're ongoing, 
were compared again to that registry, the patient registry with matched patients on a propensity score. So there's a very good model for CF of the slope of that line as a function of the characteristics of the individual. Statistically, patients are matched, and then you compare those that are treated to those that are not, and you can see in uh, the two cases, the, rate, the decrease in rated decline is actually similar. Uh, it's 47% for Kaleidico and 42% for Orcambi, and that's interesting and it, because the acute effect of Orcambi in Delta F508 homozygotes is smaller than the acute effect of Ivacaftor of Kaleidico in the patients with G551D, but the long-term effect, at least with regard to the slope of the line, seems to be uh, less different. So I'm going to now just wrap this part of the talk up by saying that where we're headed with this. Because there's actually a number of key facts I told you, some of which we only really got the data this year, that tell us that not only is this CFTR the cause of the disease, not only do we have models, not only can you develop medicines that work in the models and translate, but that you can actually have long-term effects as well as short-term effects. And so our goal now is to actually try and bring every patient with CF to carrier levels of CFTR function because based on these data, one would predict, but obviously you have to do the work and then assess it, that that would actually further uh, change the course of disease. And if you look here at where we are with Ivacaftor, you can see that, that's the blue box, but with Lumacaftor and Delta F508 homozygotes, we're not as far along towards that goal. And so what's very exciting in the last couple of years is that we've actually been, made a lot of progress with the chemistry of these corrector molecules. And all this is meant to say, uh, because it's something I learned about in the last couple of years, this is thousands of molecules that were profiled in human bronchiopothelial cells. And you can see, first of all, that uh, these are three compounds that are now in development, but you can see a spread. This is chloride transport in the X. This is when the studies were done. And you can see an increase where we're getting to higher rates, 80 carrier levels, beginning to near carrier <laughs> levels with these combinations. But, but I got asked the question by friends, and I wouldn't have known the answer necessarily a few years ago. Well, there's a lot of them up there. Why did you pick VX659 or VX440? Why did you pick that one as opposed to one higher up? And that's because efficacy in a dish is only one of many properties you need to actually be a medicine. So efficacy in a dish is, is desirable, but you also need to be metabolically stable. You need to be absorbable if it's a pill. You need to have good PK in the blood. You need to be very safe if you're gonna try and treat kids and, and people with a disease and you wanna keep them healthy. And there are all these different properties and you actually need not one molecule, but you actually need many molecules to find the one, and it's not a random walk, it's actually, that's what medicinal chemists do, is they go back and forth between the biology and the chemistry. And it's actually an incredibly hard problem, but I'm excited by the progress being made. And this just shows you a now a real head-to-head -head comparison of the het min genotype. So these are the 40% of people who have only one copy of Delta F508. There's no approved medicine today for CFTR modulation for this group because we're only approved because we've only shown efficacy and safety in the homozygotes that we're now able to get uh, above the level of benefit in vitro of chloride transport that we have for Ivacaftor in the G551D patients and nearing carrier levels, and these three molecules, 152, 440, and 659, two of them are in phase two we announced last week, and one of them is starting phase one this month. And so our strategy has become to really aspire and develop molecules that can get at least the 90% of people who have one copy of Delta 508 up to a carrier level or as close we can get, because we've already shown with Ivacaftor and Lumacaftor that something short of that has substantial benefit and uh, acceptable safety and tolerability, and we now aspire to push that benefit higher. This is just a, uh, some people are visual learners. So this is actually, it turns out in these cells in a dish, I've shown you graphs, but it turns out these cells have cilia, and they beat, and that clears the mucus. And that when you have a CFTR defect, the mucus is thick and the cilia don't beat. So these movies are now on the top row of cells, human cells in a dish, homozygotes on the top for Delta F508, on the bottom, these het min, they're called, Delta F508 and a minimal function mutation. And if I show you first the movie of cilial beating in the untreated or the vehicle treated, you don't see anything because there is no cilial beating, be at least that you can visualize. If you treat with this combination 661 and IVA, which is essentially uh, is a, phase, uh, a combination that's in phase three but is similar in in vitro efficacy to Orcambi, um, I'll show you that in the homozygotes, you see, uh, you can now hopefully see some wiggling, and uh, that's in a phase three program now, so we, we're looking forward to getting that data. But in the het min patients, you don't really see much beating, and that's consistent with our clinical data that showed that this combination, we couldn't demonstrate 
substantial efficacy with only one couple, copy of the Delta F508. So now the triple therapy, which is now in phase two, uh, just starting phase two, I should say, you can see a lot more wiggling, and also in the het min cells, you can see the wiggling as well. So this is actually really a different measure that's actually proportional to the graphs I showed you, but we found that some people are visual learners and prefer the wiggling, so I'll show you the wiggling. So, so that's, that's now become our aspiration, and it's actually something I have to say I'm, I'm tremendously excited about, challenged by, uh, but that I don't think we at Vertex thought was even on our, I don't think it was on our radar screen two years ago. I don't think we actually thought that it would be, remember I showed you that chemistry progress with finding these molecules? We were certainly thrilled and we were very pleased to have two medicines in the market, but the idea of getting people with one copy of Delta 508, 90% of people to a high level of benefit, just we didn't have the, the uh, proof points in vitro, and we also didn't have the long-term data in vivo, in patients, that would that tie this together, but obviously um, we have a lot of work to do. The other thing I won't mention, but just to just say is, there are five or 10% of people who make no protein, and so we have collaborations with Moderna, making mRNA therapies for CF, and also with the company CRISPR Therapeutics doing gene editing, because uh, whether or not that'll be needed for, if we could achieve the goal with the small molecules for 90% at high levels, that might not be necessary. Of course, we might fail to achieve that goal, although I don't think, I think I'm confident, but again, we haven't done it yet. But certainly for the people who make no CFTR, uh, that's not gonna be a, probably a successful strategy, and so you need a, a nucleic acid approach. So, I find this a remarkable program to have the, the luxury and the opportunity to be a part of because it really illustrates, to me at least, all the aspects that we aspire to in precision and personalized medicine. It's deep understanding of the human biology. There's specific mutations that have different genotypes and different mechanisms that medicines have actually been developed. Those medicines have actually been studied in large clinical programs and long-term real-world follow-up, not just based on extrapolation. Um, and also there's now a path, we think, to now get from uh, this initial phase where the mutation, where the, the, the medicines are more genotype specific, if we can get the, in this case where there's one variant that's carried by 90% people, at least in one or two copies, if you can get, we now think it may be possible, we have to show it's true, if you get a single triple combination therapy that will be less personalized. It'll be personalized for CF, it's not asthma or COPD, but actually you would be able to, if, you, if the clinical data showed safety and efficacy, that you'd be able to actually treat a larger number of people. So it's an interesting thing that actually I think is the story of how, for example, cholesterol lowering happened. If you look at LDL developing therapies, and forget PCSK9 for a minute, statins were first developed for familial hypercholesterolemia a genetic disease. Then they were secondary prevention of people with high LDL. Then they were primary prevention of people with high LDL. Then the study showed that actually their primary prevention is equally effective in people with normal LDL. And it became much more of a population basis, but all the clinical investigation was needed, and you also need a tremendous safety database and also molecules that were effective and well tolerated. But I think that that will actually be the path, and I realize this is a little contrarian. I don't actually see the world looking 50 years from now when we're done that all these diseases have been sliced into little slices and they're all different. Although, like in the case of CF and G551D or other cases, it may be there's an incredibly, or familial hypercholesterolemia for heart attack, there may be incredibly prismatic opportunities where you actually learn and you first demonstrate because there's the greatest benefit to balance whatever risks there may be. But I think that actually the biology in some cases will be very bespoke and very unique to the individual, and then it'll be very difficult to actually to ever prove it because it's so rare. But in the cases where, as we're seeing here, you can begin to build out from that to other patients, it may actually in the long run become less personalized. So I told you about this story. I do want to be clear that I think this timeline of 26 years, and by the way, I hope I conveyed we're not done yet. We have 10 years of work. If we're going to get to, if we're successful, which we haven't yet obviously convinced you that we, we are because we have a lot of work left to do, it'll be 10 years till those medicines that are now in clinical development would be approved and have long-term safety data and be widely used and all those things. And that's it for successful. So this is a, and John Todd and I were talking right before the talk, and you know, a career is not really long enough actually, although, you know, to necessarily get all the way from the basic discovery to the biology to the disease, or at least I'm not good enough and fast enough to do it in one career, maybe other people are. But I think that on the other hand, if you ask where would we be with this disease and others that we could talk about if no one had done this work, the answer is we wouldn't have any of these therapies. And so it's not a question to my mind of, I think, I think actually my experience in medicine is most of the time these things don't happen, right? Most diseases, you don't get a transformative change in the care of the disease. And in all of medicine, 
every few years something like this happens. And I'm, you know, whether it's you know, uh, uh, antibiotics for peptic ulcers or minimally invasive surgery or the discovery of the BRCA mutations and what that leads to. These are not everyday occurrences, but when they happen and they have clinical impact, it's a remarkable thing. So if this is the vision that I at least stated my, my sort of sense of what precision medicine is about strong understanding, root causes, modifying the course of disease, showing all these things, not just claiming them, but showing them in data, I'll close with some challenges. Because I do think there are many of them and I want to both be balanced in terms of the opportunity, but also I think these are addressable in some ways. So the first is this idea that we need to understand human disease biology is sort of obvious, it goes back to the first book I told you on the first day of medical school, but actually my experience, it may be different at Oxford and in the UK, but in America, studying human disease biology is actually not really the coolest thing to do. It's actually, there are a lot of people who say everyone's claiming it's all translation now, but actually there's an awful lot of it which is in systems that are very valuable but may not tell us as much as we need to know about humans. And so I do think that we've lived through an era where thousands of Mendelian disease genes and thousands of clues about common disease in people have been learned, but the pharmaceutical and biotech industries can't work with them unless we have understanding. And that's actually something that I actually think is the academic community's job. It's a very hard job, but I have no doubt that it's a doable job. But it will take actually a belief that understanding human biology, especially when it tells us something that we didn't know in model systems, is worth understanding. Because I hate to say it, but what usually happens is if it's, not, if it's understood in model systems, people then pop the gene from humans into the model system and say success. But when there's nowhere to go, it takes a certain kind of fortitude and tenure and funding from the Wellcome Trust or the Howard Hughes. You will not get your grant funded if you say, here's a gene and I don't know what it does and I want to try and figure it out. And so that's a problem if this understanding, like that CFTR is a chloride transporter, is key to understanding the, the therapeutics. The second is, many of the targets that we'll learn about from human genetics and biology are not classically druggable. They're not enzymes and kinases and GPCRs. And so either we can say, well, we won't work on them, or we can say we won't really be disciplined about the human biology, we'll go somewhere else nearby that we have a convenient target, or you expand the reach of therapeutics. And that happens all the, that, not all the time, but it does happen. Antibodies and biologics were an expansion. And now, you know, uh, RNA therapies and gene therapies are an expansion. I think actually my colleagues uh, developing small molecule correctors was kind of an expansion. That wasn't a standard thing to do. It could be small molecules. But I think that we need to expand that reach. The third is that, um, we need to actually figure out how to do this prevention. Because actually I see it said a lot, and I think we all aspire to it, that we want to use the knowledge of genetics to prevent disease before we occur. But man, is that hard to do clinically, actually, in clinical trials. So in the case of CF, our path, which is getting us there, but it takes quite a while, is to start with adults who already have established disease, and then to work backwards to kids, and then to follow for years to show these long-term benefits, and we hope over time that we'll build that case, and we hypothesize that if you treat a cohort of people starting, we're now approved down to age two for uh, some of these cases, and you treat, and that rate of decline is maintained, that de decrease, it'll play out over time as much more valuable than waiting till someone's sick. But if you think about the timelines, even in a disease like CF, that's a challenge to actually prove that. And here, registries are incredibly important. I can't emphasize enough how important to the CF story, the CF community organizing the data, tracking patients for many years, knowing those rates of decline to enable the kind of studies I'm describing. Very few diseases actually have that. And then you're in the position of not really knowing what the natural history would be. And so you either do randomized trials for many, many years, which are not gonna be practical, especially for rare diseases, or you need really good registry data. So that's an implication. We also need then regulatory pathways that actually know how to work with in a rigorous and disciplined way that kind of data. And finally, and I'm not gonna get into this too much, you know, there is a societal question. If there are only 75,000 people with CF or 1,000 people with Dravet's syndrome or some rare disease, the amount of work and effort this took was not actually demonstrably different than what it would have been to do a common disease. So there is a fundamental fact that if you're gonna develop, if kids with a severe disease in particular were gonna develop medicines and therefore a smaller number of people, there is some value proposition there that needs to be looked at in a way that's not equating you know, uh, different parts of society with different types of disease and different ages and all that because either that or we won't do it for these rare things because it simply won't be practical. So this is, those are some challenges. I actually think they're all very, achieve, very achievable, they're not easy, but I think they're all achievable. So I, my title of my talk was Humanizing Drug Discovery. I hope you got the sense that, you know, that's sort of the, around the idea of a long journey for me personally, but one many people in this room have been on, of trying to use human biology 
as it does to discover new things and also try and inspire the development of new medicines. But the other way of humanizing drug discovery is to tell you the people who did it. And I'll just note that uh, I've never worked with, I've worked with some fantastic scientists at the Broad Institute and Harvard and MIT and at Oxford and Cambridge and they're fantastic, but no more fantastic than the people at Vertex who did this amazing work. And on the left are Fred Van Gore on the left and Paul Negulescu on the right who have led this project for uh, 15 or 20 years between them, 115 and 120, never stopping and still going strong, their team in San Diego, and then all the people at Vertex in preclinical development and clinical development and the commercial organization who go to work every day just to try and actually make this story happen. So thank you very much. If there's time, I'll be happy to take any questions.